We're here as Apple Juice Productions. We are a local production company, and we make um, films and web series for women and by women. And we've made a lot of series and short films based on fandom. So we did a series inspired by Jane Austen's Northanger Abbey, a series inspired by the Babysitter's Club, and then a series of Harry Potter fan films that are centered around Lily Evans. So, um, and then we have our first original series coming out on September 19th called Better With You, and it's a rom-com. And yes, so be thinking of questions and we will answer them at the end. Um, but I would like to have everyone introduce themselves first and go ahead and share their current favorite comic. So I'll go first. Um, I'm Kaylee Brown. I'm the technical director of Apple Juice Productions, and I also work as a cinematographer. Um, and my current favorite comic is Snot Girl. We'll just go down the line. Okay, uh, I'm Jen. I'm a writer, um, and my favorite comic is Lumberjanes. I'm Samantha. I'm also a writer, um, and my favorite comic is also Snot Girl. <laughs> I'm Amanda, I'm a writer and actress, and right now I'm very into giant days. Good choices. Okay, so let's share a little bit about um, why you like indie comics and also how you were introduced to them and came to like them. So Jen, do you wanna go first? Uh, yeah, so I started getting into comics when I was in college. Um, I majored in English, and I was writing a paper comparing uh, novels to more non-traditional literature structures. Um, and I picked comic books because they're uh, short. <laughs> so um, I didn't really know anything about them. I picked up Batwoman uh, because she was a queer character and I liked the art style and uh, I just got hooked. And then once that series ended, um, just was looking for something less mainstream, uh, I found uh, Lumberjanes first and then just have continued getting into the genre like that. Um, I first got hooked to to comics in general when I picked up a copy of The Wicked and the Divine. Um, I'd never seen a comic with a female lead before, so it was kind of my, my first um, encounter with, with that, and I just fell in love with them immediately. I love the this visual storytelling is just fantastic. Um, I first got into this kind of what we're talking about, this indie uh, scene, uh, because I don't really like superhero comics, but I wanted to start reading something in the medium, um, and I had a lot of friends who were kind of getting into it at the same time, and so we were all recommending things to each other uh, that is, you know, boombox and image and coming from those other places that allow a little bit of a different storytelling, but I also wanted to bring up what we were talking about earlier, which is Calvin and Hobbes, which is <laughs> kind of like our main entry point, um, we're sisters, to reading in this you know, format and um, the visual storytelling that happens with that and how clever it was. And so comics were always, I think, a part of our reading and like, you know, as yep. in my rotation, I've always had like a comic book or two, um, but only lately have I really seen it uh, be the type of storytelling that kind of matches what I'm watching on TV and watching in movies and those kinds of things. Yeah, um, I was introduced to comics actually by Amanda down at the end. <laughs> Snot Girl was my the first comic that I read. And as a cinematographer, and I also like doing illustrating, I have I was really drawn to like the visual aspect of it which is interesting because I was not really like as into picture books as a child like I've usually been more into chapter books and things but I love comic books for their illustrations and things um so how do you guys think that comics are similar to like other versions of storytelling like books tv shows movies etc um because I always kind of think of comics as like personally for me like watching a TV show or something because it comes like in episodes <laughs> and issues and you kind of see it that way so yeah uh, Samantha um, I think they are similar comic books are similar to other versions of storytelling because just like you said it's kind of like watching an episode of something unfold page by page um, but they're different in the way that they tell the stories, um, and I think one of the coolest things about comic books is that they can really do anything 
without being bogged down by production design or costumes. You know, it's all just right there on the page. Um, so it makes it a little, it's a little more simple than a television show or a movie, in my opinion. Jen? Um, I think on the surface, they, they seem kind of childish because a lot of the times they're dealing with like fantastical situations. So in, uh, one of my favorites is Lumberjanes. And it's this group of Girl Scouts that are like fighting three-headed, three-eyed wolves, and you know they deal with yetis and like Greek gods and goddesses, and it's just these really fantastical, sort of absurd situations. Um, but I think they're similar to other forms of media because at the heart of them, there's something really genuine and um, truthful in terms of like yeah, they're fighting yetis, but at the heart of it, it's about friendship and love and how these kind of people that felt like misfits uh, found each other and then were stronger because of it. So I think in that regards, when you look at the heart of it, it's about truth, and I think that's true of any form of media. Oh, that's really cool. Uh, I'm going to say how they're different for me. Hopefully okay, that doesn't it. step yeah. on your next question. <laughs> um, I read a lot, and I read a lot of novels. You know, I jumped in very early to that format. and. Uh, so in that way, comics are really different for me because they are still reading and they're absorbing things with sort of an added visual element. And I think people think of them as being really simplistic and like, oh, it's like simple, easy storytelling. But for my brain that's used to like creating all the imagery when I'm reading, uh, I sit down and I pick up a book that already does that for me and it's really different and it's challenging in a different way um, that... I kind of, I always forget and I don't anticipate and I don't retain stuff as well sometimes from comic books because it's so different and I really have to like concentrate because it's just not the same thing at all. Um, Kaylee says it's like watching TV for her, but I still think of it as like, I'm going to read this book. So my brain is programmed to be like, this is what reading feels like. And then I have to go, oh, it's totally different. Uh, so I like it in that way because it's kind of like a new way of getting the story, getting the visuals and being able to... Um, be given by the creators the elements that they really want me to have you know they're when you're a novelist and you're showing not telling you you know there's always places where people are gonna be like oh well, I pictured it like this and it's totally different but when you have kind of all of the elements given to you um, you have to absorb it in a different way and so I always have to uh, kind of shift my brain and say okay now we're doing comics we're reading and watching a comic <laughs> yeah I mean I like how you said that they're a challenging media too because I a lot of times I think the perception can be that they're like easy to read or it's just fun but it is like it it really is a different form and you have to pay attention and it's it's very fun to consume but like it is a different way so I I really like that you said that um what are some of your guys' favorite comic book adaptations or not favorite um <laughs> but they're people have taken comic book I mean the MCU is obviously a, a good example but what are some other like adaptations that you guys love okay I'll go first uh, <laughs> my favorite um, film adaptation is Scott Pilgrim yes. it is so true to the way the comic reads down to you know the captions and just everything that happens it's just fabulous um and he uses the visual text yeah, on the screen yeah. as well. Everything in that movie is so nerdy and, you know, it's all related to video games and comic books. And instead of, you know, making it more mainstream, they just stuck to the way the story plays out. Um, and I think they did a fantastic job. Edgar Wright's a genius. And I think we've all... Every person who's seen that movie and loved it and read the books before or after seeing the movie um, can now appreciate that it's become a little more mainstream because that came out in, I want to say, like 2009 or something. Yeah, yeah. Um, and at that point, you know, we were still transitioning and the MCU was becoming a bigger deal and comic books in general were just becoming more accepted. And now we have Spider-Man into the Spider-Verse, which is like this gorgeous celebration yeah. of not only the characters mm -hmm. that we're kind of used to, you know, we know Spider-Man pretty well at this point, but also this medium and the way that they animated the movie looks like a comic book and he uses a comic book when he gets bitten. He goes to the Spider-Man comics as like the how-to, um, which is so cool and different. And I think just like instead of having like a marginalized group of weird nerds reading comic books, like in Stranger Things, for example, we can now just be like, everybody's doing this because it's the cool thing to do. Yeah. 
Um, I've got a couple of favorites right now. Um, I am a huge fan of the Umbrella Academy on Netflix, if you haven't watched it, uh, Kaylee Brown. <laughs> Jen keeps telling me to watch it. <laughs> um, you should watch it, it's excellent. Um, That's Ellen Page, right? Yeah, yeah. she's and excellent. She um, and then one of my other favorites, uh, there's a movie called Blue is the Warmest Color. Um, it's a French film, it came out in 2013, I think. Um, but this, it was actually adapted from a graphic novel. Um, and I like the movie, but I actually very much prefer the graphic novel. It's a little different, um, but it's like really sad and beautiful and sort of this just perfect little tragedy nugget um, in graphic novel form. So that, that's one of my favorite ad adaptations. I promise to watch the Umbrella Academy. I'm so sorry. <laughs> yeah, me too. I promise. <laughs> oh, good. We'll watch it collectively as a group. Yeah. Um, what um, are okay. so the comic book genre can be like really specific. So, what are some of the things that you guys like within the genre? Like we've talked about that a little bit, but um, it's like what are some of your favorite favorite comics? Why do you like them? Like, how do you think they use the genre well? Amanda. Me. <laughs> uh, I mean, I'm, I'm predictable. I like the same things in comics that I like in TV shows that I like in movies that I like in novels, which is good romance, good friendship, and like good team-ups. So um, things like Lumberjanes, which she's already talked about, where it's uh, you know this whole little collective of ladies that have all kind of found each other, and they're an unlikely merry band of misfits type of thing. Like they all have their own very distinct personalities. Um, Heavy Vinyl, if you have not read that, highly recommend. Um, same kind of situation. It's kind of a workplace comedy. These women all work in a um, record shop in the '90s, but they also have a Fight Club. <laughs> so um, it's a little bit of uh, those elements that. That, you know there's always going to be like so-and-so has a crush on someone and that's like a you know a b-plot um, and then like these friendships how they kind of play out and what the dynamics are but often with the comic books that I like there's a fantastical element so she mentioned the wicked and the divine which is like my favorite thing ever and it is a lot of just like human drama but it's with the heightened element of like they're gonna die soon uh, they have magical powers um, you know other things that are a little less relatable um, but generally, I think the the storytelling is so of such a high quality and high caliber in these independent comics that are created mostly by and for women. They're kind of telling these female stories that they can get into kind of the weeds of what does it look like to be in an interpersonal relationship. And I do think those are always the most interesting stories. Whether or not you have uh, your newspaper delivery girls running into dinosaurs, it, is irrelevant. <laughs> you can choose to do that, and that's Paper Girls, and that's fun. But um, it's mostly about the friendship, and Jen kind of mentioned that. You know, the core is the love and the good storytelling, and that's that's what I look for. Jen, uh, yeah, I'll echo that. Um, I really like good characters, and I really like good storylines. Um, something I always look for is um, so I like kind of the fantasy stuff, you know. Um, but I like I like it to be surrounded against, uh, surrounded by sort of this reality. Um, so Paper Girls, which you mentioned, is also one of my favorites. And I like that one because it's uh, bonkers and they don't really give you any context. Um, like they're just like, here's things that are happening and you have to kind of try to just roll with it as it happens. Um, and it's, it's pretty cool. And there's these relationships that are like the foundation of it. And so there's kind of four main characters and the, I like that they all have different relationships. It's not just like two sets of best friends that happen yeah. to be but next to each other, right? All of their relationships are really important. That's cool. Um, and it's the same thing with Lumberjanes. Um, I like different relationships. I like um, just well-developed characters that aren't one note. So I don't, I don't love the, this is a good person and they only do good things and this is a bad person and they only do evil things. I like to see like, you know, real people reflected in that, so. Yeah, I think they do a really good job of portraying real characters, despite whatever fantastical elements are in the comic books or whatever crazy is happening. Like, the characters are relatable and they're fun. and They have um, good relationships, which I think is always very important. Samantha? Um, I think my favorite thing would have to be, I'll just kind of echo what Jen said, um, I love being just dropped into the story with no explanation or 
kind of background on what's happening in the world, you know, you just have to pick up the comic and start reading, and eventually it will make sense. Um, and I like that. I think it takes a lot of patience to kind of get into a comic book or a comic series because they spend so little time explaining things, um, and it's all just happening, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think they tend... They, the creators, yes, the of, authors of comic books tend to trust their audiences more a little bit than yeah. um, if you're making a TV show. You have to make sure that it's going to appeal to like a really wide range of people, and there's executives, blah blah blah. But if you're writing a comic book, you're kind of just like, well, I trust you, um, and so they they do that a lot more, where they're kind of just like, here it is, accept it or don't. That's the story I'm telling. <laughs> well, I think that's especially true with like indie comics because there's less of the kind of fitting into the narratives. They can. You know, I mean, there's, it depends on the comic, but a lot of the time they're just like, I did a thing and I hope you like it. And I think that's really cool about the genre. And, and I think most people do because you can feel the enthusiasm, you can see the love being put into it, and you can tell that, like, if you're going to be along for a journey, that there's going to be payoff generally. If you're like, okay, I'm going to read issue one and this doesn't make any sense to me. Paper girls. <laughs> what is happening in this comic? Um, and then on and on, you know, you get more of the story unfolding. It really pulls you in uh, rather than... I feel like sometimes uh, stories explain the magic away or the mystery away. Um, and you never really get that with comic books. They're always always something fresh, new, and they're and using made-up languages, going to places you never knew existed. There's just, there's like this sense of boundlessness in the comic book universe where they can really do anything, say anything, be anything. Um, and I like that. Yeah, I mean, they really go... The, I like what you said, that they just they can kind of be whatever they want to be. And it's it's really interesting, like, picking up a comic book for the first time and just being like, okay, I don't know what this is. And um, getting into it. And you, it's cool because you basically get to know the characters just by, like, I don't know, seeing them, like, in present time. Yeah, like, like seeing going, the story play out. Yeah, exactly. Then you get to know the characters Like, more. nobody's telling you anything about the characters. Like, in books, for instance, they have descriptions about the characters, and you get to hear about the perspective of someone else. From, and that, that's similar in, like, even or in pages and pages and of a monologue, someone, yeah. like, <laughs> describing things. In comic books, it's just like, here it is. Hope you like it. Yeah, like, it's mostly dialogue, and you get to, you just, like, you see it happen, which I think it's... It's a cool part of the genre. Um, I actually, I really love the Archie comics, but the the recent ones that have come out in the past few years, because um, I've watched Riverdale and it's an entertaining show. Um, <laughs> but the Archie comics are, I just think they're really fun. They've I, they've been a good way for me to get to know the characters and like really get in that story and. I like those characters, and I like that there's a different medium that I can see them in that doesn't have to be bad writing. Um, like, I will forever think of Archie Volume 2 and just think of this, like, image of Betty and Archie in there. I'm like, oh, it's beautiful. So I think um, they, like, can really stick with you and um, just have an impression on you. Um, how do you guys think that the comic, that comic books have become more mainstream like with indie comics and then maybe also like transferring into other mediums as well um jen <laughs> um i think one of the best things about marvel being sort of the juggernaut that it is um is that it's kind of taken down a little bit of the stigma around comics um because for a long time it was like you're either a comic book nerd or you're not like there's like been this weird delineation kind of based on your personality um, and your interests, and I, I think that's uh, stupid um, to kind of be like, oh, this is the thing that I like, and it's the only thing that I like, and I'm not going to cross over. So I think with uh, more and more people getting this sort of mainstream introduction to uh, what began as comics, uh, the sort of stigma of like, oh, that's for like nerds with pocket protectors and stuff like that, I think that's like <laughs> those lines have kind of broken down, and um, with that, more and more people are kind of discovering like, oh, this is pretty cool or like, I'm not into this, which either way is fine, right? Nothing appeals to everybody. Um, but just having that ability to like realize like, oh, I can like whatever I would like and it's totally fine. I, th I think 
from that perspective, uh, comics are more um, sort of available than they've ever been, just in terms of like the, de the degrading of the sort of arbitrary delineation, I would say. Yeah, totally. Um, I think just the fact that indie comics exist um, prove that comic books have become more mainstream because you no longer just have to pick between one of the many Spider-Men or <laughs> X-Men, which there's a lot of. You can choose to read about newspaper delivery girls traveling to the future or a social media star with a dark side. There's just so much more out there um, to read than there was before, you know? There's, uh, there's just always new things coming out. Uh, the, the sign for me <laughs> that comic books were uh, in the mainstream was when they made Twilight into a comic book. So they're taking a very specific audience that is looking at you know, a novel and then a movie and on and on what it became this huge, like you said, juggernaut. Twilight was massive for a very specific audience, which was young women. And when they were able to translate that into a successful comic book and people were purchasing that in that medium, I was like, aha, <laughs> we've got everyone now. Because that was kind of like the final frontier, right? Comics are for boys, they're for young boys, now they're for older boys because the boys grew up. Okay, well, maybe like some older girls are reading stuff because they're from like a generation where they were, you know, nerds as children or whatever it was. And then it was like, okay, young contemporary women are now reading comic books to the point where we can, you know, sell them this story in this format. Um, and it's become more of a thing uh, in that sense where now like Northanger Abbey also has a comic book. That's a Jane Austen novel from 200 years ago that they were like, we think you'll like it like this. And it's, they do. People are, you know, um, absorbing it in that medium. And now it's kind of gone the other way where they, there are TV shows that are, um, targeted to women kind of of my, you know, in their twenties and thirties, like glow and, um, sweet vicious and stuff yeah. like that. That's like, okay, this show is for a very specific audience, and then they've turned it into a comic book after the fact because they know that's going to be popular. Um, so I think that was the sign for me, like, that everybody was okay with it and on board and, like, excited about this medium. Yeah, um, Sweet Vicious is something I especially thought about and how something I really like about the comic book genre is that it, it's a lot easier to make. Um, Sweet Vicious is a TV show that was on MTV for a season, it's Everyone so watch good, it. <laughs> um, and it's it, the best. Yeah. Seriously, it's so good. It, it got they're making it into a comic because yeah. it got taken off. It air, got unfortunately so. canceled, and so um, which is really sad because the story like was so good, and then um, it was really cool to hear that they were gonna make it into a comic book because now this TV series like they basically gave themselves permission to continue the story like without having to. Um, ask MTV, like, they were able to just say, like, no, we want to keep telling this story, and we're going to, um, just through a different medium. And now people who are fans of the show have something to look forward to. Yeah, totally. Like, it's really cool to see stuff like that happen, and yeah, Glow, like, have a comic. Um, I also think it's kind of, um, like, slipped into almost, like, the hipster area a little bit with, like, zines and things, which you guys can talk a little bit more about, because I know you also like them but um <laughs> they um like zines are in are like the like indie tiny com com indie, like indie tiny, comic yeah they're like tiny indie comics yeah oh they're so cute um yeah and that's kind of they've like they've evolved into that sense too which is another way to show like oh this is becoming more mainstream because people are also like using that in a way yeah. i don't know um i don't think zines are like a new new thing no <laughs> new new but um they've had a little bit of a resurgence because for a while it was like oh we have the internet where we can like put all, all of our creations out there and we can yeah. kind of show off our art and all those things and that's kind of people are discovering that that's not um benefiting them in the way that they were hoping so they've kind of gone <laughs> back to publishing which is I think a good thing. I study print journalism, print journalism. <laughs> so uh, it's, it's fun to see kind of like this uh, resurgence where, you know, cassette tapes and now zines, like, oh, we're going to make our own comic books, our own magazines, our own, yeah. we're going to tell our own stories uh, because there is an audience, there's an interested group of people who are willing to purchase these things and know what they are. I mean, for a while it was like, what's a zine? But now we zarin. know. <laughs> what's a zarin? <laughs> Um, what, 
are some of your favorite women creators in the comic book industry specifically? Um, one of my favorites is Veronica Fish, who has illustrated some of the Archie comics, as I previously mentioned. Oh my gosh, but, I'm going to say this before anyone else can. Kelly Sue DeConnick. Wow. <laughs> um, she wrote the latest um, Captain Marvel, the ones that the movie is mostly based on. She has a cameo in the movie. I screamed. Um, and she also has this great indie series called Bitch Planet, which is about women who are non-compliant, which is to say, like, not Stepford wives, and they get shipped off to this other planet where they have to go live their rebellious lives in a, in a prison planet. Um, just and the women. Just the women. Not the it's, men. It's just so women. just like, it's amazing commentary. The storytelling is incredible. The characters are insanely wonderful. Um, and she's kind of launched this whole revolutionary thing with uh, women getting tattoos that say like NC for non-compliant and like buying the merch and stuff, just like kind of giving women who are human people a voice. Shocking. Um, but she just, she um, has a lot of interesting, you know, she has her hands in a lot of different places in the comic book world and her husband is also a, um, a writer. And they all kind of, they work together to kind of further their <laughs> agenda, let's say. Um, but it's a, it's a good one. And she's, she's really deserving of kind of the, the what she's gotten because she's just a wonderful person. And her storytelling is, it's out of this world, literally. <laughs> um, okay, I have to say Leslie Hung, who does the uh, illustrations for Snot Girl. Someday she'll come out with her own comic and it will be phenomenal. Um, Fiona Staples as well, who is responsible for the Saga series, which are also phenomenal, very fantastical. Um, and I have to say Kelly Sue as well, because... She deserves being mentioned twice. Yeah, she really does be, deserve being mentioned twice. And she was inspired to write Bitch Planet from um, Margaret Atwood's The Handmaid's Tale. So if you know anything about that, they, they kind of go hand in hand together. Um, my favorite quote from her is if you can replace your female character with a sexy lamp and the story still basically works you need another draft <laughs> um, and I think that's so eloquently put but also very honest and true um, yeah Kelly uh, Sue so I also love Kelly Sue, so I'm just going to third that. Um, Deserves to be mentioned three times. We're all <laughs> Kelly Sue fans in this room. Um, and then my, my other two are kind of on opposite ends of the spectrum. So I really love, um, I mentioned Blue is the Warmest Color, the author of that, uh, Julie Moreau. Um, it's, it's a downer, um, but beautiful. And then on the other end of the spectrum, um, Noelle Stevenson, who did Lumberjanes and Nimona. Um, and hers tend to be far more lighthearted. Um, and I like those because they're kind of escapist in a really pleasant way. Um, in that at this camp, like everybody's just part of the group, right? So there's like a trans character and there's, you know, yeah. two w girls that are in love with each other and there's a non-binary character and it doesn't, it's not a thing. Like, it's not like, oh, I overcame your weirdness and I like you in spite of it, yeah. right? Like they're just part of the group. Um, and so that's really nice to think um, that, you know, someday if I have children, I'd like them to feel like that, you know, like their identities, whatever they may be, is like not that issue of like, oh, we love you in spite of this, but just we love you. And that's, so I, I really like hers a lot. I also have to mention Gail Simone, even though we're mostly talking indie, but she wrote the Birds of Prey, like the most iconic Birds of Prey stuff that I'm crossing my fingers. The movie is exactly like it because it's <laughs> perfect. Um, why do you think it is important for women to be creating in comic books and I guess in general and also like um, I don't know are there some of your favorites where you've seen that represented also um, just like representation in general for like the queer community and diversity and stuff um, I'll go first I think it's always good to have um, balanced perspectives um, so when I was an English major I remember realizing that like 90% of what I had read was like dudes, uh, which is fine. And they're beautiful stories, you know, Great Gatsby, it's my jam. Um, but it's, it's a very like one-sided perspective of the world. Um, and when you get to be that kind of like, oh, this is what life is like, and you're only reading about things from men's perspective, right? You're just cutting out an entire part of the planet, which is um, just, 
not great. Um, and I think it's really important not just for women to write their own stories, but for men to see how women view themselves. Um, so when you look at it from that perspective, right, like I've got a nephew, um, and like I want him to see not just my perspective on being a woman, but other people's perspective on being a woman. And so when you have more people at the table, you get more, um, like more viewpoints and more perspective, and you see the world from a broader angle, and I think that's really important, regardless of what kind of media you're consuming. Um, just having more people at the table and not just having that one single voice. Yeah, totally. I mean, I selfishly am a woman, so I would like more <laughs> female creators so that I can become one of them. If there's space for one, there's space for all. Um, so that's part of it, <laughs> is that I'm a storyteller, and so you know, I don't, I don't want to block anyone else from trying to share their perspective. And like Jen's saying, it's valuable always to have more perspective and um, women of color and uh, women from the LGBTQ plus community and, and everybody from all of their different perspectives and bringing all of their um, personal experiences into their storytelling, I think, is incredibly valuable. And in independent comics especially, I think we are given a lot more opportunity for that. You know, you can kind of make a list of TV shows, prominent TV shows that are um, created by women that are telling female stories. It's a short list, but if you look at the comic books, it's like, oh, we got like, we got a stack of 20 right here. Like, what do you need? What are you looking for? What kind of story do you want? What kind of characters do you want? There's so much more variety, and I think that's huge because I don't know if you've ever met any human women, but they're different from one another. And um, it's, it's really nice that we have kind of that proof in the storytelling that is in independent comics. Um, I think the most important reason to give women a space in this um, genre is because men often write about women in a way that they are pit against each other one's better than the other. Um, and to have women writing about female relationships between women, um, to be given that opportunity to actually, you know, dissect a relationship between two female friends, it just opens up a conversation, a dialogue. It makes it a lot easier to read. Um, and I think it's really important to give women a voice in the comic book world so that we get away from the damsel in distress trope um, or from women against women you know one's better than the other um, it's really important just like Jen said to get those perspectives on not only what it's like for me to be a woman but what it's like for every other woman um, and I think females heavily re rely on their friendships their relationships with other women. Um, and to have that accurately portrayed by women authors is fantastic. And I hope to see a lot more of it. Yeah, I think we often see the trope of like one girl and then like five guys and then the group. And I, I just find that so interesting because personally that's not my experience and that's not most of the women's experiences that I know. Like most women are surrounded by girls and go to the bathroom with all the girls and they, yeah. <laughs> they're, um, they're very much like in with their female friends and I think that's important. And for me, like when I'm watching and reading things, it's always very important to see a woman um, in some like main role because I'm always going to be able to see myself more in those stories and be able to relate to them. Um, as a woman of color, it's like important to me as well. I love um, Brooke, not to like get into TV, but I love the show Brooklyn Nine Nine. They have diversity, and then Jane the Virgin also has um, Hispanic people, which is I'm Hispanic, and so I watching those shows, I immediately get so excited to just like almost see myself like. And it's not even that I'm like those characters personality-wise, but it's really important to me to just even see someone that looks like me and be able to be like, wow, like if I want to, like I could dress up like them or I could um, like, I just, I feel like I can relate to those characters or I have a similar experience to them. So um, it's important to have diversity and also have that for women because there are so many types of women, like Samantha was saying, and they, we need more of it so that we can continue to see ourselves in media. 
Um, I want to add just something onto that because I really like what you said. Um, I feel like a lot of the time um, when we've had like men writing stories about especially queer women, um, it's like very sexualized and it's just like, this is super hot, you guys. Isn't this like awesome what's happening here? Um, and as a kid, like I just, that was my representation and it kind of sucked. Um, and so like when you have more people that are involved and you have queer women that are involved in the writing and stuff, like you also see that sense of like, oh, this actually reflects my experiences. Yes. Um, so this is gonna sound so lame, but um, so Supergirl, there's a character, Alex Danvers, and like there's a scene where she comes out to her sister and I was like, oh my gosh, this is exactly what it's like. This right here is my experience. And that was the first time that I ever had that moment of like, oh, th I know this feeling. And I was like sitting on my couch crying, which I never do. Um, but it was, you know, because they did a good job telling a story instead of just being like, hey, isn't this hot? They're making out, right? So <laughs> it's really important to have diversity in the writer's room. Just, you know, as women of color, yeah. um, having, having actual people that have gone through, through those experiences makes a huge difference. Totally. You don't want women to be devices. They shouldn't just be something to ogle at, like, oh, yeah. look how hot this is. That's a yeah. person with another person. Yeah, and whoever, like, people should be allowed to share their experiences, like, and be able, like you said, um, have, what am I trying to say? They should be able to, if they've experienced something, then they should be the one sharing it and maybe not like a man who has no idea what it's like because then you're giving, you're not only not helping women not see themselves in media, but you're also giving a bad representation to everybody else who sees that. And, and then, I think it doesn't have to just be like, oh, men aren't allowed to tell women's stories, but like there are experiences that I haven't had. And so in some ways I don't want to tell those stories because I want to make space for other people who have yeah. had those experiences to tell those stories and I want to tell my stories. And, and I think the more we open it up, the more opportunity everybody has to be able to do that and feel like they have a space to tell what's theirs. Yeah. Um, okay. So to before we get to questions um what are some of your favorite local comic book stores and then what do you guys look for when you're looking for a new comic sorry that like switched gears a little bit but uh, jen um i like black cat comics um you know my first comic book experience was at a heebie-jeebies so that place will always have a special place in my heart um mostly i look for uh i like diversity in characters um and sometimes, uh, like art styles, like, they, they just don't land with everybody. Yeah. Um, so, true. so like Rat Queens is objectively awesome, right? Like it's super cool and awesome. And for whatever reason, like I just don't connect with it. Um, and so it's like, I kind of look for, oh, I, this appeals to my, you know, what I like. And it's not always easy to tell what that's gonna be, um, but the aesthetic um, always makes a difference for me. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, I'm big on aesthetic as well. I, uh, I'm a sucker for some good cover art, so I always <laughs> pick comics based on how interesting I find their cover art to be. <laughs> um, I love Dr. Volts. It's on 33rd South, I believe. Yeah. Fantastic. There are genuine nerds over there. You can ask them about any issue, any publishing company. They know the answer. Um, yeah, Dr. Volts. That's my favorite. Uh, I mostly look for kissing, so <laughs> when people are recommending stuff to me, they, they're always like, it has a great romance, otherwise I'm like, but why am I going to like this? Um, a friend just recommended a book to me called Kiss Number 8, and the main character's name is Amanda, and I was like, you have won this game. <laughs> um, but again, it is a little bit of like, okay, what do I look, look for in general? I'm always looking for romance and good friendships. Um, but the art is huge, and I think that's such a funny... Uh, there's very rarely a, a time where I'm like, oh, I was watching this TV show, and I just like hated the way it was shot. I couldn't watch the show anymore. I don't think that's ever happened. But if there's a comic book that I don't like the art, or the art changes, I think it was Archie where it was like the I first so two or three were Veronica Fish and then they changed it and we were like ew we hate it, <laughs> it volume just, two it was, is beautiful and it was really jarring three. um so that, I mean I think that's just another unique element of the genre is that you can really connect with the art um whether or not the story speaks to you sometimes or not the story but not the art and finding that combo is just like it's it's a real hit and miss I just want to add something. I uh, think it's really nice. You don't have to love every single comic. 
Um, just like Jen pointed out, sometimes there are comics that you can say, yeah, they're great, I, they appreciate, I appreciate it, but I never really got into it. And since there's so much diversity and so many different comics to read, if you don't love every single comic, that's fine. You can keep looking around for something else to um, read and to connect with. Um, and I think one of the other thing that's uh, kind of interesting about the comic book genre in general is that you can, in fact, like more than one female character. Like, <laughs> so my old boss Shopping. had the misfortune of being the 90th person to ask me, um, oh, you saw Captain Marvel? Is it better or worse than Wonder Woman? You have to pick one. And I just unloaded. And I was like, I do not have to pick one. I can like both. Um, exactly. Girls pitting against each other. Yeah. We don't need that. There's um, room to love Captain Marvel and to love Wonder Woman. Yeah. So I think it's always nice to like realize like, oh, just because I'm super under Wonder Woman, I can also like, Batman Woman's awesome. Yeah. Right? And so kind of not letting yourself get into that. Like, oh, I only like Wonder Woman. Like, if I'm going to read a female character, like, I can only like this one. That's stupid and boring and kind of small-minded. So Yeah, it sucks. I mean, like, which female movie? Like, there's one female-led movie in each of the universes. Which one do you want? Like, well, <laughs> yeah. that's, like, a really hard... <laughs> I can like them both. Um, yeah, I think... I also like Dr. Volts, by the way, to look for comics, but yeah, I think uh, the art really is important. That's something I like hadn't even thought about, but I do like kind of get um, turned off by a book when I'm just like, eh, like, the art, like the art changed, or it's not something that I, it's like really resonating with me because it's such a big part of the comic, possibly one of the, like it's as important as the writing for sure. Um, so I think that's pretty cool. Um, do we have any audience questions? You can come to the microphone or you can raise your hand. Yeah? Uh, I'm just looking for recommendations. Um, like for me, art is a very big part uh, uh, of my life. And so I'm looking, growing up, I would go to comic book shops and bookstores and look at the, the cover art and you were catch the light on. That's, that's amazing. So, what kind of recommendations do you have uh, about the storylines of the comics? I'm familiar with Saga. Uh, the, the Wicked and the Divine. Yeah, actually, it yeah. is beautiful. Every page, there. It's. I I can't e I can't even put it into words. They're just so. The art style is so unique and so detailed and so specific to each character. Yes, it's very colorful, but at the same time, very dark. Yes. Um, every panel is like, who are we in with? Because that's what it's gonna look like. There's neons and there's, it's so bright. The story, <laughs> just FYI, um, it's about uh, basically like a worldwide pantheon of gods. So it's like Greek gods and um, gods from ancient Egypt and ancient Mesopotamia and just like everything you've ever heard of. All those people coming back together. Satan is one of the characters, um, and so they're they're she's all together. Hot. She's very hot. <laughs> um, they're they're all together, like trying to whoops navigate the modern world, and they all kind of have this like superpower where they um, you know that people like fall at their feet and worship them. So they're all famous musicians. That's like the way they've decided to use their power. It's just it's very very brilliant. There's many layers, and yeah, it's the main so the main character is a woman of color, um, a queer one woman of color actually, and so there's just there's so much always like swirling around and going on but it's not at all confusing it's just like it's really well done it's beautiful just beautiful yeah uh do you want to yeah. recommend anything do you have any recommendations um i just from an art perspective this isn't indie but the batwoman comics of like 2010 ish um that's what actually got me into comic book writing and it's just got a really cool diversity of art styles um so it's not just like panel 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 like they it's, they do an incredible job of just building out all of this action in different and unique ways. So, so I'd recommend that one for sure. Um, another one, I do second The Wicked and the Divine. I read like five volumes in one day, so it's really good. Um, I really like Afterlife with Archie. I keep mentioning the Archie comics, but this is a separate thing. Um, it is like Archie, but zombies, and it's incredible. The guy, it's really interesting because the guy who wrote Riverdale wrote this comic, which would make you think okay don't read it but um <laughs> but the comic is incredible it's so good it's kind of has some humor in it um and it just like 
it goes there. Like it takes kind of like, oh, like this town could be supernatural and like, or whatever. And it goes there and does that. And it's really fun. So highly recommend that as well. Um, I also want to recommend The Dreamer. And it is the story of a, a girl who falls asleep. And when she like wakes up, it's kind of like Outlander in this way, but she finds herself in 1774 or something like that. So it's like pre, pre-Revolutionary pre War where like everything's stirring up and whatever. And it's also written pre-Hamilton, but has a lot of the same elements where there are like, there's a black George Washington um, and just other things like that. And I'm like, hmm, when manuel Miranda stole this. And <laughs> um, it's really creative and kind of fun. It's like a fun historical fiction comic um, that steps outside of uh, what I would usually think of as a comic book, I think. Any other questions? Yes. Yes. Giant Days. It's just about three girls at uni in yeah. the UK. They just like live their lives. They have boyfriends and girlfriends. They get into like hijinks where they like forgot to study for a class. That's like as intense as it gets. Um, <laughs> there's no supernatural or fantastical elements. It's it's super sweet. The characters are very, very good. And um, the art's great. And there's like 12 volumes. So there's plenty to digest. <laughs> yeah. Um, I would say Snot Girl. It is a little murdery. <laughs> But it's mainly just about a girl with allergies. <laughs> and uh, she's so pretty. She's got green hair. It's very good. The art style is beautiful. Um, like I said, a little murdery. I, I don't know. Um, I would say heavy vinyl. Um, there's like a fight club element, but it's, it's, it's just really cute. I don't know how else to describe it. And it's very 90s. Um, on the last panel, the one of the authors has like a playlist of '90s songs that she listened to while she uh, wrote it. Yeah. So, yeah, it's it's very cute. Yeah, very, I was, highly recommend. I was gonna recommend that one too because it like happens in real life, but then they have like the Fight Club, so it's like fun, like ooh, cool, like something a little more adventurous. Um, and it's it's all girls, so that one's that one's really good. Uh, any other questions? Yes. Big question. No, this is, no, this no, is, no, no, is great. Uh, this is something we talk about all the time because, as she mentioned at the the beginning of the panel, we are an independent film company, and so we we create scripted, narrated narrative content. We're not like vloggers or whatever. So it's like it's it's really difficult because. Um, uh, something that's become very popular in kind of the less mainstream is doing like crowdfunding and um, putting yourself, very much othering yourself and saying like, I really want to be able to make this thing. So you go over into this other channel where your audience is funding you and your audience is supporting you, um, which I think is really limiting for creators because it makes you into not a creator, but a marketing tool. So you're a brand now and you're constantly, you know, instead of churning out like your amazing comic book, you are on Twitter, um, which isn't really what you do. And I think the the main issue that has happened with that is that a lot of those kinds of creators and smaller creators, including ourselves, we've crowdfunded, um, you don't know how to get into the mainstream. Like, how? who do you talk to? How do you start those conversations? Um, so unfortunately, I, from my perspective, it really needs to come from the top down and it needs to be like, okay, Ridley Scott produces everything you've ever seen if you really look into it, but like he funded Lady Bird. Like he helped Greta Gerwig write and direct a movie that then got 99% on Rotten Tomatoes and got nominated for an Oscar. Um, and so it's not, it's not like we don't have the skills. It's not like these uh, lesser known creators are lacking in any way except for just that avenue into you know, the golden gate. Um, so I think, yes, 
always support those people. And when they are doing things that are like, hey, can you help me with visibility? Can you help me with um, just promoting and that kind of stuff? Like, you don't necessarily have to, to give them money. That's awesome if you can. But just really being enthusiastic and being vocal um, because that's going to really help people. And I think that's kind of where we've come to in this world right now is like, oh, I will hire you because you have X number of Instagram followers, which sucks, but that's just kind of like how it is. So if you have indie uh, creators that you know and like, be loud about it. Don't be a lurker. Be very vocal. Yeah, I think just like saying something is at least helpful in that sense. Like having the conversation about it, saying that you want it is for sure a step in the right direction because, I mean, I definitely hear all the time like, oh, it doesn't matter. Like um, it needs... It's like, um, like it's like that Dr. Seuss bo book where they're all trying to like scream and like break the barrier to like for the elephant to hear. Anyway, I'm not very. Horton hears a who. Horton hears a who. Yes, <laughs> they're all trying to scream, and that's kind of what needs to happen with this. Like, there's like this whole community of women, and we need to like be talking about it and screaming about it so that the person at the top can hear and be like. Oh, okay. Like you guys do want this. Got it. We will give it to you. So, um, and just quickly, I think it's always important as a consumer um, to kind of put your money where your mouth is. Um, so when you hear about companies that treat their female employees like garbage, like stop buying their stuff. There's so much out there that you can enjoy. You know, video games. There's a million video games. So being conscious of like, I, I want to support movies and books and video games that have strong female characters, and if they don't, I'm not gonna consume them, right? Because there's not, as a consumer, it's harder to make a difference other than using your voice, but you can also, you can also use your wallet, so. Yeah. Um, we are out of time, so thank you everyone for coming, and thank you for the questions. Um, if you would like to know more about us, you can follow us on Instagram or Twitter, um, at Apple Juice Pro. Um, we also are going to be having a free screening of our rom-com series on September 19th. And if you, it's at Bruby Cinema Pub in Salt Lake City. So if you want to come, um, you can come to us afterward and we will give you a flyer, give you all the information. Um, and yeah, that's everything. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you.